Shalom, my name is Joseph Shulam, and we are continuing the study of the Torah, of the weekly portion, the same portion that is read in the synagogues. And uh, we are uh, happy to have this opportunity to share with our brothers and sisters in Korea from the regular Torah reading in every synagogue in the world and joining together with you on Brad TV. God bless all of us and all of you in Korea. Last week, we studied a portion of the Torah that ended at uh, verse 3 in the Hebrew text of chapter 32 of Genesis. Jacob and his family had just left Haran, his uh, father-in-law's house, with his wives, with flocks, with wealth, with riches, and he got to the River Jordan, almost to the River Jordan, and he got to the River Yabok, and there, in the dark, as he's about to cross the river, he meets an angel, an angel of the Lord, and he battles with the angel of the Lord, and he held his own, and... Uh, he stands unwilling to let that angel go unless he gets a blessing. And the angel blesses him and uh, allows him to continue his journey into the promised land, into the land that God promised to Abraham and to Isaac, his fathers, his grandfather and his father, Isaac. But Jacob knows that he has to contend with his brother. He's just minutes older than he was. They were twins in the womb of Rebekah, their mother. And Esau came first and Jacob came holding on his heel. And uh, Esau despised his inheritance and he sold it for a bowl of soup, traditionally lentil soup. And so Jacob now is crossing the Jordan and he knows that sooner or later he is going to have to meet with his brother Esau. And he doesn't want to have a war with his brother Esau and with his brother's men. Jacob is described in the earlier portion of last week's portion as a man sitting in a tent, contemplating, philosopher, thinker, but not exactly a fighter. Esau is an outdoorsman and he's a fighter, he's a hunter. So Jacob wants to do everything possible not to have a military 
physical war with his brother and with his brother's men. So what does he do? And that's how our portion of the week starts in Genesis chapter uh, 32 verse 3. The portion starts by Ishlach Yaakov and Jacob sends messengers before his brother Esau to the land of Seir which is on the other side of the Jordan closer to the northern side of the Dead Sea. And he gives instruction to the messengers that he sent how to address Esau, his brother. He says, when you meet him, speak to Esau, my Lord, in this way. Thus your servant Jacob says. I, I want you to understand, this is the Middle East. And we are still today at war, combating terrorism of the Hezbollah, of the Hamas, of Fatah, the PLO, the FLPLO, the, 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 all the different factions of Palestinian Arabs, part of the greater Arab nation. We're combating them until this day for the right to appropriate the promises of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promises of the land as an internal inheritance. We are still battling the same battle between Jacob and his descendants and Esau and Ishmael and their descendants that comprise the Arab nations. So the relevance of this portion of the Torah is very great. So Jacob gives instructions. Humble yourself before your enemy. He realizes Esau is his brother. He realizes that Esau is very angry with him. He, he, he knows that Esau had made a decision in his heart that when Isaac dies, I am going to kill my brother Jacob. And he's not sure whether that decision is still in vogue or did Esau forget it. But he knows that Esau probably did not forget that hate that is so deeply embedded in his heart and is still so deeply embedded in the hearts of our far, far cousins, the Arab nations. And even the Arabs who are Israeli citizens. We have over two million Arabs who are Israeli citizens. Some of them even serve in the army. Their children serve in the army. But the enmity is still there. That's why the relevance of this portion of the Torah is not only relevant for far back history, but is relevant for today as well. So he says to his servant, you call Esau in my name, my Lord Esau. And you present me as to Esau as your servant Jacob. And then you explain to him a little bit about the history of the last 21 years. I dwelled with Laban until now. Esau knows who Laban is. Laban is as much his uncle as Jacob's uncle. He's the brother of Rebekah, their mother. So I've dwelt with Laban. He also knows how far Laban lives in near Aleppo in northern Syria, Haran. I dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female servants. And I have sent to tell my Lord, to tell Esau, my Lord, he calls him, that I may find favor in your sight. In other words, find favor in your sight in plain English is, I want to make peace with you. That's what it means. I find favor in your sight. I want to make peace with you. The messengers go to Esau and they return to Jacob and they report to Jacob. We came to your brother Esau 
And he is also coming to meet you with 400 men. Not with women, not with children, not with flocks, not with servants, but with 400 men. Jacob's reaction, oh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of my brother Esau. I'm distressed. The text says in verse 7, chapter 32, I'm distressed. And so he takes a strategy. He takes insurance. He divides his camp into two. If one half of his camp is attacked and he loses, he still has another half of the camp of his family, of his flocks, of his wealth, secured. So he divides his camp, his people, his flock, his wives, his children, into two halves. And verse 8, and he says, if Esau comes on one of the companies that I've divided, then I still will escape with the other company, with the other half. And then verse 9 of chapter 32, I think is one of the most beautiful prayers in the book of Genesis. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country, to your family, and I will deal with you well, right properly. It happened in Parashat Vayetze when Jacob is running away from his brother Esau according to his mother's instruction. And that meeting after he saw the angels coming up and down the ladder, that meeting with God in which God says, I promise you that you will go and you will return. And Jacob now reminds God in his prayer, which is okay, he doesn't think God forgot, but he just wants to reassure himself in his prayer that God didn't forget. You told me, Lord, return to your country, to your country. I want to stress that. You turn to your country and to your family, and I will deal rightly with you. Until today, folks, this idea whose country that is, is still debated in the United Nations of the United States of America and the rest of the League of Nations in New York City. But in the Bible, the promise of the country, of the land between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River and up to the Litani River in the north and up to the river of Egypt in the south is the promise of God in the Bible that is repeated more than any other promise in the whole Bible. And it is already also in the New Testament when you follow the word inheritance, even to our Gentile brothers and sisters, then you see that that's the, the only inheritance we have in the Bible. It's this piece of land. And Jacob continues his prayer. He says to the Lord, I want you to, to listen. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. Now, this phrase, all the mercies and all the truth, is uh, uh, a, a wonderful, 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 wonderful promise and wonderful, wonderful truth that needs to be reiterated because this phrase grace and truth appears in the New Testament one time in John chapter 1 verse 17 the law was given through Moses and grace and truth came from Jesus Christ but it appears more than 20 times in the Old Testament but it's translated with synonyms like in this case in the New King James Version with mercy and truth. The people are not usually aware enough to connect that mercy and grace is more or less the same thing and it's the same Hebrew word. So Jacob in verse 10 
says to the Lord God in his prayer, I am not worthy to the least of all the mercies and all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esav, for I fear him, lest he came and attacked me, the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. This is Jacob's prayer. And it's a very interesting prayer. And we have so much to learn from. First of all, the humility that Jacob addresses God with. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of all the goodness, of all the mercy, of all the grace that you have shown me. I'm not worthy. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm sorry that I have to step out of the political correctness and say things that may sound not politically correct. There is nobody in the Bible that in his prayer commands God to do anything. There's nobody in the Bible, in the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, that commands the Holy Spirit to do anything. We should all approach the throne of grace with our prayers, on our knees, in our beds, when we talk to our children, when we talk to, it, to the Lord through the Holy Spirit, with humility, like Jacob, like King David, like King Solomon, if you wish, like the prophets. What is this? We're commanding God to do things for us? We're commanding the Holy Spirit to do things for us? We should take a much humbler attitude of servants, not of masters. And I'm going back to the text. Jacob prays that God will deliver him from his own brother Esau because he's afraid of Esau. And he reminds God, God's promises. You promised me that you will treat me well. You promised me that you will take care of my descendants and that there will be many like the sand of the sea that cannot be numbered. And now I'm here in this situation, I have to divide my camp into two halves for my safety, for my insurance, for my security. And then after this prayer, Jacob goes to sleep. Chapter 32, verse 13 in the English. So he lodged there that same night and took what came in his hand as a present from Esau, his brother. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milk camels, and their clothes. In other words, by the time he wakes up in the morning, Esau had sent gifts to Jacob. I think that what, what melted Esau's heart was the humility, the simplicity, the honesty in which Jacob approached him. Not as somebody who owes him something, not as somebody who did wrong, but somebody who is humble and willing to be a servant of his elder brother, elder by a few minutes, brother. When S. Esau, his brother, meets Jacob, they meet. And it's a great moment. It's a great moment. What happens when they meet? They fall on each other's shoulders with tears. Property, land, promises, blessings. Boom! They don't disappear. They're still there in the background. For that moment, they're brothers. In that moment, they fall on each other's shoulders and they kiss each other. 
It's a great moment. It's a great story. You should read that uh, text from Genesis chapter 32, verse 3 in the English to 36, verse 43 in the English. Jacob is, is wrestling with the angels after this prayer. And he, with the angel in the river, he book, he's wrestling with him after this prayer. And uh, then he goes, I would say, with God's blessing, with God's assurance to meet his brother Esau. And they fall on each other's shoulders and they kiss each other. A wonderful situation. And the place where all this happens is in verse chapter 32, verse 30. It's in a place called Peniel. Peniel means the face of God. A place called God's face. God's revelation of his face to these two brothers who have hard feelings, who have hate, who have demands, who have complaints about each other. Jacob lifts up his eyes and he sees Esau coming and he puts his wife Leah and Rachel and the maid servants and their children up front in the beginning of the camp so that Esau will see Jacob's family. This is my family, my brother. These are my children, my brother. These are my wives, my brother. That softens Isa sees Jacob's family and he runs toward him and he embraces him and he falls on his neck and kisses him and they both weep. I think that I'm going to end the, the teaching on this portion with this scene from chapter 33 of the book of Genesis. Because this is a great moment and there is so much that we can learn about each other as brothers. And even if we're not physical brothers, we are brothers in Christ. We are brothers with the Presbyterians and with the Baptists and with the Pentecostals and with the Methodists and, and, and with everybody that confesses that Yeshua, that Jesus is the Son of God the Messiah, that God so loved the world that he sent him, this Jew that was crucified with a sign over his head, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This King of the Jews is the King of Peace. And we need to learn, yes, we may have arguments. Yes, we may even have history of hating each other and persecuting each other. Yes. But we are still brothers and we need to learn from this scene to open the arms and welcome each other and say, brother, yes, we may have disagreement. We may have hard feelings, but we are still brothers and fall and weep with each other because God is one and the Messiah is one and he is the only head of the church. We have no one else except him. May God bless us all and learn to make peace between brothers from this section of the Torah. God bless you and Shalom.